thunderstorms, <laughs> Sophie. Susan, thank you. And that's it from the BBC News at six. It is time now to catch up with our teams right around the nations and regions for the news where you are. Goodbye. Hello, good evening. Welcome to Look North, our top story tonight. Ready to lift the local economy, the South Yorkshire airship factory set to create a thousand jobs. We're bringing a brand new green aircraft production line to Doncaster with all of the supply chain that's needed around that. So that's 1,200 new jobs in aerospace. We'll assess what it could mean for manufacturing in the region and ask if this is the future for short-haul flights. Also tonight... 19 months of suffering, the 12-year-old girl from Selby who still has the long-lasting effects of Covid. We'll look at how Yorkshire celebrated the coronation weekend and meet some of those lucky enough to be at that ceremony in London. The Yorkshiremen defying the weather to raise thousands of pounds, skateboarding 80 miles for charity. And it's going to be a very unsettled week. This picture taken in Skipton sums it up. There will be some sunshine, but also potentially some thunderstorms around. Join me for that week ahead forecast. Hello there, don't switch channels, you've definitely got the right place. Welcome to Look North and our new home. We hope you like it as much as we do. First on the programme tonight, a pioneering aircraft manufacturer is set to open a new factory in South Yorkshire with a promise to create more than a thousand jobs. Modern airships for greener short-haul flights will be built at a site in Doncaster. It's been hailed as a huge economic boost for the region. So what exactly is an airship? Allow me to explain. A hundred passengers can be transported in a cabin suspended below a 19-metre long helium balloon. Now, this can reach speeds of around 100 miles per hour. They'll emit 90% less carbon than a traditional aeroplane. 1,200 people will eventually work at the Doncaster factory with the first airships floating into the sky in 2025. Our transport correspondent Spencer Stokes has been speaking to the company promising to put Doncaster back on the aviation map. Looking like something from another planet, could this be the future of short-haul air travel? The UK company behind this helium-filled aircraft believes so. And next year we'll begin building the first of their airlanders, at a huge new hangar in Doncaster. For the time being, a mock-up at a warehouse in Bedfordshire gives a glimpse of a very different travel experience. So this is an example of what we can do with airlander like nothing else flying today. This one's for our tourism and leisure clients, but imagine this fitted out instead with 100 business class spacious seats. We're bringing a brand new green aircraft production line to Doncaster with all of the supply chain that's needed around that. So that's 1,200 new jobs in aerospace, a big new facility with aircraft being built and flown out of that facility for flight testing. It's a huge project and really exciting for the region. The original airlander has now been deflated, but this is what it looked like in its hangar. A similar facility will be built in Doncaster, and the city's former airport is one of several potential sites. Instinctively, it might feel like Doncaster Sheffield Airport, if we can get that reopened, is the best place for them. And there are, of course, benefits to putting aviation in a cluster. But there would be tension between massive blimp-like aircraft taking off uh, alongside a working airport so it's not a given that's where it goes and the most important thing is we get them to Doncaster and we get a site that works for the manufacture of those aircraft. Hybrid air vehicles say even though the location remains under wraps they will invest more than 300 million pounds with work starting later this year. We'll see aircraft flying from a couple of years time and in service uh, with, its, with their first customers in 2026 or 2027. That business will be exporting uh, aircraft all around the world uh, to go and fly those regional flights, net zero, coming out of the UK and more specifically out of Doncaster. There she goes, she's just away. Airship technology dates back a century, this one launching from Manchester in 1932. Back then they were inflated with flammable hydrogen. Today helium fills the canopy and orders for Doncaster-built models have already been placed. 
in Spain. We're working with Air Nostrum, uh, one of Europe's biggest regional airlines, and that is on pure passenger transport, 100 passengers at a time. What we're looking at in Scotland is a mix of passengers and freight uh, to deliver people and things to the places that need them. Doncaster has, for the time being at least, lost its airport, but touchdown for hybrid air vehicles promises a very different aviation future in South Yorkshire. And certainly very fancy looking at the inside of there. Spencer's here now. Welcome to our new home, Spencer. Why Doncaster? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I think because the Advanced Manufacturing Research Centre is based down the road in Rotherham, they've seen some high-profile companies based there, Boeing and Rolls-Royce, so that's attracted them. But the Combined Authority, the Mayor, Oliver Coppard, has also played a big role in this. He's offered them £7 million as a loan if they set up in Doncaster. They've accepted that and say they're coming later this year. So I've asked Oliver Coppard this afternoon if that's public money well spent. Every investment, every business which is trying something new, which is at the cutting edge of the technology, always comes with risk. But this is a this is a qualified risk that we are taking in a business which has a really solid and firm plan for how they're going to grow and develop their business. And as you say, this is a loan which is guaranteed against the business, and therefore we have every um, expectation that that's absolutely safe and secure. And it's an investment in our future as a region. We've got that fantastic black and white archive footage. This technology has been around for years, hasn't it? Why is it only happening now? Yeah, you can go back more than a century to the first airships. It's because of carbon emissions, quite simply. So growing pressure on airlines to look at ways of reducing their carbon. One of these will see a 90% cut compared with an aeroplane. And of course, they can carry a lot more passengers than a green aeroplane, an electric aeroplane, only a handful of people on there. One of these could have 100 people travelling at 100 miles an hour. Built in Doncaster, hybrid air vehicles won't operate them, they'll then send them to an airline and they'll decide where in the UK, Europe or across the globe they are going to run. Fascinating. I'm sure our viewers will be excited to see how it progresses. Thanks, Spencer. Next tonight, a mother from Selby has described the heartache of watching her 12-year-old daughter's daily struggle with long COVID, 19 months after her first infection. Freya Chilvers is among an estimated 53,000 children aged between 2 and 17 who've struggled with the effects of the disease for more than a year. Now, while Freya has received help from a specialist NHS clinic to treat her symptoms, many of the underlying problems persist. Our health correspondent, Jamie Coulson, has her story. I usually have a headache all the time and exhausted all the time just from doing really little things, like going to school, just really tired. She'll spend a lot of time pretending she's well and putting on a brave face and smiling. But as a mum, I can sort of look at her and tell she's in pain. How are your legs? Because she said they were hurting after school. Freya Chilvers first caught COVID in October 2021. Since then, she's been living with a long list of debilitating symptoms. Before infection, the 12-year-old was active and energetic. But now the long-lasting effects of the disease have left her struggling to maintain a normal school and family life. So Fraser's got long COVID, um, chronic fatigue syndrome, um, PEM, which is post-exertion malaise. So you do something and it can hit you 48 hours later. Um, so going to dance on a Saturday can then mean she's in bed on a Monday. So this is when we went to the long COVID clinic. Last summer, we filmed Freya as she was assessed by experts at a long COVID clinic in Leeds. Since then, they've been helping to manage some of her symptoms, but many of the underlying problems persist. We're grateful for the NHS. The problem is long COVID's quite new, so we're just managing symptoms. It's not, there's nothing that we've been given that's a cure or that can really help. Professor Stephen Griffin is a virologist at the University of Leeds and a champion for the charity Long Covid Kids. Everyone is being exposed to multiple rounds of infections of this virus and unfortunately that very small risk because of the sheer scale of infections becomes meaningful on a population scale. And unfortunately at the moment there are something over 50,000 children who are suffering Long Covid for more than 12 months. And if you think about the impact on their education, on their development, on their socialising, that is really, really damaging. 
we don't know what's next, we don't know what the future holds. We hope for more research and we hope for more clinical trials, but I didn't think we'd be 19 months in and still in the same situation. I used to be so busy all the time and now I just hope to get better at one point so I don't feel exhausted all the time. Well, Freya, I do hope you start to feel better soon. That was Freya and her mum, Emma, talking to our health correspondent, Jamie Coulson. Right, let's get some more of today's news now. Police have launched a murder investigation after the death of a man in Sheffield. Emergency services were called to the Woodhouse area yesterday after reports of an assault. A 19-year-old man died at the scene. A 49-year-old man was arrested on suspicion of murder but has been released without charge. A 17-year-old has been stabbed in Leeds during an attempted robbery. Police were called just before 8pm yesterday to the junction of Street Lane and Allerton Place in Moortown. The victim was taken to hospital with non-life-threatening injuries to his chest and arms. West Yorkshire Police are asking any witnesses to get in touch. The chief executive of Yorkshire Water won't be accepting a bonus this year after public anger over river pollution. Nicola Shaw says she understands the strength of feeling about the issues linked to river health, which is why she's turned down the bonus. Annual reports show that she could have received between six and eight hundred thousand pounds. So did you watch it? Around 20 million people tuned in on Saturday to see this, the coronation of King Charles. In a moment, we'll hear from three people who attended the actual ceremony at Westminster Abbey. But first, in our region, hundreds of parties were held over the weekend. You certainly know how to celebrate in style. Thank you so much for all your pictures. Here are some of the highlights. <laughs> and love that we and all thy people may be in peace. What a weekend, and it's certainly one that our next guests won't forget. An honour to be our first guest in the Look North studio, but I think being at the coronation on Saturday, Pam, Hermione and Rowena is one that you certainly won't forget. Pam, how was it? Oh, it was fantastic. It was really special. Uh, you felt important. You felt part of the event. And, oh, yeah, the day just went smoothly. It was great. Now, you told us last week that you were quite nervous. The atmosphere, what was it like in there? Yeah, I felt nervous because I, I don't think I expected what I expected and uh, the atmosphere was fantastic. Everybody was chatting to each other, making you feel relaxed and then once it started it, it was just brilliant. And you had a front row seat, didn't you, of did, everyone yes. going past? I was quite lucky that I was sat where the entrance was, so I could see everybody that came in, the politicians, the dignitaries and then the royal family, so that was special. Hermione, you were there for seven hours, weren't you, in true British fashion, there early to queue. <laughs> How did you fill the time? Well, you know, we got there half past six in the morning, but actually the whole process is, itself went really, really smoothly. It didn't seem like seven hours, it seemed like five to seven minutes, actually, and I wish I was there even longer. So it was just a, an amazing opportunity to witness something, you know, globally that is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Now, you were invited, weren't you, because of the work that you do with different communities in Bradford, especially dur during the pandemic. In terms of multi-faith, do you feel that that was reflected in the service? Of course it was. There was people of uh, faith and no faith there, people of all different cultures, and it was amazing to see multicultural Britain there uh, at the coronation. And how about you, Rowena? You were nominated because of your work that you do as a carer. 
How important was it to, to have that work recognised? Absolutely immensely important. I mean, you know, care, the work of carers is often misunderstood and, and maybe not as recognised as it ought to be in communities. So, so to have the BEM then to be invited to such a magnificent event that was absolutely, truly amazing. Yeah, really, really important. What was the highlight for you of the day? Um, well, everything, of course, was just, I'll never, ever forget it. But actually, the highlight was meeting the people around me. They were such special people that had done so much for their communities and their, throughout their lives, wonderful people. I met some wonderful people there, and I'll never forget them. And how does it rate in terms of days of your life? Oh, probably the best day ever in my life. Really? Yeah, yeah, ever, aside from the fact of giving birth to me too or something. Well, we, of course, let's hope they're not watching. <laughs> and Pam, what happens after? Because you've been part of history, you've witnessed all that. What do you, where do you go from there? Well, once the procession's left and uh, the important people, like the royal family, the dignitaries, and then the famous people, then you just follow them out. And uh, once again, I managed to catch some of the politicians as they were walking out, so that was really nice. And then you just walk on, um, you was well looked after, you was uh, guided round, so it was, it was really nice. Hermione, did it feel like you were part of history? Oh, most definitely so, you know, soaking up that atmos atmosphere, witnessing a, a truly great event you felt more than part of it you was uh, it was just amazing it was breathtaking and a day i'm sure you will never forget thank you all yeah. for sharing your memories with us welcome Absolutely. thank you right time for the sport now sally is here in fact she, she's right over there can you hear me i can <laughs> just about yes yeah. Uh, end of the season nerves for Leeds fans have well and truly kicked in after a weekend of changes at the bottom of the Premier League table. This is how it stood on Saturday when Leeds played Man City. They were just above the relegation zone when they lost 2-1 under new manager Sam Allardyce. Not their worst performance recently though, but yesterday Everton and Nottingham both won their matches, pushing Leeds and Leicester into the drop zone. As you can see there, now much better news for Bradford City though. They secured a League Two playoff place in front of more than 22,500 people. The Bantams drew one all with champions Leighton Orient thanks to Brad Halliday's deflected volley and they'll play Carlisle United in the playoff semi-final first leg at Valley Parade on Sunday. Sheffield Wednesday pushed Derby County out of the League One playoffs with a 1-0 win at Hillsborough. Derby had a player sent off, allowing Michael Smith to score a decisive penalty for the Owls, who will now face Peterborough in the playoff semi-final first leg on Friday. I absolutely want to go in with form and we've got for form, we've got momentum and you've seen the atmosphere in the stadium, you've seen the atmosphere when we've been on the road and... Uh, I'm really pleased that we're going into them playoffs as one. As, as, and when I say as one, I mean as a group, as an army, in terms of the team and the supporters. Meanwhile, Doncaster Rovers have sacked their head coach, Danny Schofield, due to poor results. They finished 18th in League Two. Schofield was appointed in October after being sacked as Huddersfield's manager. He won 10 of his 33 matches in charge of the Rovers. The club say they'll announce a replacement within 10 days. Now, Great Britain missed out on becoming European wheelchair rugby champions at the weekend with a 55-49 loss to France. Jamie Stead from Normanton scored early on before France took control. But all is not lost for Jamie and teammate Gavin Walker from Rotherham, who qualified for the Paralympics in Paris next year by reaching the final. And City of Leeds divers Jack Law and Anthony Harding won silver at the World Cup in Montreal. The pair placed second in the men's synchronised three-metre springboard. GB came away from the competition with four medals, with Matty Lee, also from Leeds, getting a bronze. So lots of playoff excitement to bring you over the next few days, including Chesterfield, who are one game away from returning to the Football League. They play at Wembley on Saturday and we'll have coverage of that, Amy. It's all happening on Saturday, isn't it? Thank you, Sal, <laughs> because this is happening in just a few days' time. The world's largest live music event, the Eurovision Song Contest. I don't know about you, but I absolutely love it. This year it's been held in Liverpool and the first semi-final of the competition is tonight. Germany's entry has been co-written by a stand-up comedian from Sheffield. He joins Cathy Booth at the official Eurovision Fan Zone in Millennium Square in Leeds. Cathy, you've got to have a good sense of humour, haven't you, to be part of the Eurovision party and family. 
Oh, yes, we absolutely love the Eurovision family. I'm here in the official fan zone in Millennium Square. We've got the sounds of Eurovision past playing on the big screen here. And we like to find a Yorkshire link, don't we, for you here on Look North. And this year at Eurovision, it's Anthony J. Brown. He is a comedian and a musician from Sheffield, and he's co-written the lyrics to Blood and Glitter, a gentle ditty. It's the German entry. Let's have a little listen. Blood and bitter, sweet and bitter, we're so happy we could shine. Blood and bitter, Satan sinner, we do fall before we ride. Now go, 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 with broken wings we learn to fly. We are blood and glitter. What an absolute smasher, do's poire from us here in Leeds. And look who's here. It's Anthony. How did you come to be writing Eurovision lyrics? Well, I've been collaborating with Laws of the Lost since 2015 uh, on numerous songs, many albums, and then this wonderful Eurovision adventure presented itself and I grasped it with all my talons. Fantastic. And these glam heavy metal acts, they can do quite well. Maniskin for, won it for Italy a few years ago. How do you think Germany will do? Well, I wouldn't wish to hazard a prediction, but I'm very confident in their performance. They are an incendiary live spectacle, and I've seen clips of the uh, rehearsals in the venue, and it looks astonishing. So I, I have a sense that it's going to be 179 seconds of poignant yet life-affirming bombast with a kick-ass chorus. That's just what I was about to say, absolutely. And you are going to be there in Liverpool on Saturday. How are you feeling about that? Well, I can't pretend to be glacially cool about it. I'm really quite excited about the prospect. And when I'm in there and watching them perform that song that I've contributed to, I think it will be a, an avalanche of goosebumps. I'll it will be, be fantastic. And you don't get into Eurovision to be glacially cool, do you? Thank you, Anthony, and good luck. Of course, you can't vote for the UK, so maybe that German entry should be getting our Yorkshire votes. Now, if you want to come down here on Saturday and watch the final, you can. Tickets are still available. They are on a pay-as-you-feel basis, and any money that's made goes to the Leeds Together with Ukraine appeal. So it's a good excuse to come and have a party for a good cause. It Amy. certainly is, and if there's glitter and like or like that on the night, it'll get my 12 points, that's for sure. Finally tonight, a skateboarder from Moulton in North Yorkshire is having a well-earned rest this evening after attempting to make it into the record books. Ryan Swain braved torrential rain yesterday. It was miserable, wasn't it? He started the challenge to skate more than 300 miles in 24 hours. He's been raising money and awareness for mental health charities. So how did he get on? Olivia Richwald can tell us more. Ryan Swain started his skateboarding challenge full of hope. He was planning to travel 300 miles in 24 hours on his four wheels. But soon after he began at Elvington Airfield near York, it started to rain and it didn't stop. It became clear the downpours and the puddles would slow him down. Well, Ryan's been going for more than six hours and he's done well over 50 miles and it's so hard because it is so wet and the wheels are just slowing down in those puddles and he's exhausted, he just said he needed a massage but he can't stop because he's so determined to beat this world record. I'm a bit disappointed with the weather obviously but obviously I can't be bitter about that, you've just got to keep going haven't you and, and you know it's Great Britain isn't it so it's a fitting, uh, fitting day for a fitting occasion I think so but hopefully I'm hoping now I can maybe make up some of the miles that I've lost in the first six hours. All right, let's go. The world record for long-distance 24-hour skateboarding is held by an American who completed the challenge in the Florida sunshine. Ryan has ADHD and was raising money for mental health charities. Since you were seven, I've been doing things for charity. Started off with RSPCA and biscuits and bacon and things, and he's gone on from there. Mega proud of him, yeah, mega proud of him. Uh, he never ceases to amaze me and his mum, never, in what he does and, and what he comes up with. He always thinks outside the box, which is another, another, uh, I would say, a, a good positive trait of ADHD, which he, he was diagnosed with at 22. No matter what the outcome is of today, what an achievement he's made already. Absolutely just, you know, an inspiration, really, to a lot of people. 
But it wasn't to be. Ryan was forced to stop more than 11 hours into the challenge with an injury to his hamstring. He'd skated for more than 87 miles. Here we are. So I've, I've, I've gone 12 hours and just had, I just can't take any more. I can't move it. So it's, it's, it's a shame. I'm heartbroken, obviously. Hopefully, fingers crossed, this will heal nicely and maybe we can look at maybe going again in the future. So. Despite Ryan's disappointment, he managed to raise more than £4,500 for mental health charities and he hopes the 87 miles he did achieve will soon be confirmed as a new British record. Olivia Richwald, BBC Look North, New York. Great effort. Well, it's a while since we've been in the same room together. A bit posh for us, this, isn't it? It is. You've been a bit lonely without me, haven't you, for the last seven weeks? But I say that. We're back together and we're in the, we've got some fantastic pictures to show you from the last 24 hours. Now, this is a rare one. This is, wait for it, a Kelvin Helmholtz uh, cloud. The wind speeds are higher at the top of the cloud compared with the lower section and it rips the top end off. Really quite rare clouds, thanks for that, what's Sue at Bempton Cliffs. And this sums up the weather we've had today with thunderstorms, especially in South Yorkshire and across parts of Derbyshire. If you've got any pictures, send them to me. The addresses are on your screen right now. So the next 24 hours will continue to be a mixture of sunny spells and scattered showers. And again, some of the showers will be heavy with the risk of some hay and uh, thunder the headline is coming up right now so let me explain what's happening because it is really very unsettled We've got low pressure this area of low pressure is going to drift down from the northwest but the good news is pressure then builds right across us just in time for the weekend Saturday looks a great day a bit of a question mark about Sunday after a fine start it may well rain later but uh, I'll keep you tuned with the latest forecast on look north this week now you can see on the satellite picture that the whitest of the clouds have been down across South York Yorkshire, uh, the North Midlands into Lincolnshire. That's where there's been one or two thunderstorms. But those uh, showers and thunderstorms will clear away southwards and then all parts will be dry with clear spells. We'll see lowest overnight temperatures coming in at 6 or 7 degrees. So tomorrow's high water times in Scarborough 8.01, Bridlington at 12 minutes past 8. So a lovely start, especially towards the coast. But we'll have showers from the word go. They get pushed eastwards and they develop as well the greens there indicate there could be one or two heavy ones with the risk of some thunder but just like today it's going to feel quite pleasant in any sunshine so 17 in Leeds and Doncaster that's uh, just above average for this time of the year around 63 degrees Fahrenheit so looking a little bit further ahead then it does stay unsettled heavy showers on uh, Thursday a lot of cloud but settling down a bit on Friday Saturday look at that 20 degrees for the Eurovision parties I'll what more do you it. want? I have missed you. Oh, thanks very much. But you need to polish your shoes. Yeah. You well, are lowering the tone in this well, new place. Well, there you go, then. <laughs> <laughs> That's it from us. If you'd like to see behind the scenes, go on to our socials at BBC Yorkshire of our new home. Bye-bye. Let's get there. I can't breathe. Oh, that's my girl. Let's go. <laughs> Take it up.